The tax code is not even written in English. It's written in some version of Sanskrit that nobody could ever understand. I've always considered myself a translator, turning the tax code, which I have right behind me here, this book <laughs> this is just one <laughs> of several books. You notice a lot of post-it notes in here, yeah. <laughs> the tax code sections, putting this into English. Now, this particular book runs, I don't know, a few thousand pages, but uh, this is this is what Congress does. Do you think they know what's in here? No, Nobody not knows a what's in not here. Not a chance. Uh, it's ridiculous. That's what we do. So we we've been studying this for years, as you know, and it changes not only big tax laws like we just had, but as you know from going to the programs, a lot of under the radar rulings. Starting your route to retirement. Welcome to the Guided Retirement Show. I'm your host, Dean Barber. As you all know, after listening to the Guided Retirement Show, hopefully to all of our episodes, you do need a guide, a guide to take you through all of the aspects of the great journey of retirement. Remember, it's the longest vacation you will ever take. On today's episode, we are joined by America's IRA expert, and that is Ed Slot. I've been studying with Ed Slot. For nearly 16 years, I sit on Ed's advisory board. I know Ed personally, and I will tell you that the knowledge that this man has when it comes to the tax code and the way that he has trained me and other advisors around the country through his elite IRA advisor group is second to none. And so this maze of a tax code requires an excellent guide, especially for those of you that have money. Please enjoy my interview with Ed Slot, America's IRA expert. You're listening to the Guided Retirement Show with me, good friend, and I will say even mentor, Ed Slot, America's IRA expert. Ed, let's let's get the audience familiar with you. I know that in a lot of places you're a household name because of all of the things that you've done with public television, but tell us a little bit about yourself and you know, you're you're a CPA. You sometimes you call yourself a recovering CPA, but <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, so, That's right. Yeah, I started as an accountant, a CPA. I'm still an accountant. I don't do that many tax returns anymore. I'm kind of out of that. But I realized doing tax returns, and this goes back over 30 years, that when people had retirement accounts, they didn't know what they were doing. And I would see these returns, and I would say, look what you did. You took money out. Do you know it's all taxable? Well, I didn't know. So I realized there was this huge void. You know, everybody thought the other guy was taking care of it like the accountant thought the financial advisor was taking care of it the advisor thought the attorney was care taking care of it uh, the attorney thought the cat was taking care of it nobody was taking care of it and i saw this black hole of what i call retirement planning people had just begun building balances in their 401ks and eventually to the iras for ira rollovers but nobody knew what to do when the money came out and it was a little obvious to me, even back 30 years ago, that eventually these people are saving this money for a reason to spend it in retirement. And back then, most of that money was tax uh, taxable, tax deferred, not tax free. We didn't have Roths back then. So it was taxable and they didn't count on the taxes. They didn't know how to do rollovers. They didn't know all the things we talk about in our training. Dean, as you know, you're a part of our elite IRA advisor group, actually a founding member of our, of our advanced education program. So you know about all these things, but many consumers were caught off guard on areas they thought either their accountant took care of or it's something their financial advisor should have explained to them. And they were getting these huge tax bills just because they didn't know how to get money out of their retirement savings. So here I was, the CPA, doing their tax returns, constantly giving bad, uh, you know, giving the bad information, not bad information, the bad news, you know, the kill the messenger stuff. And they said, well, why didn't anybody ever tell me this? And Obviously, I can't fix it. That's why you said I'm a recovering CPA, because most CPAs, tax preparers to even today are what I call 
are, are history teachers. They tell you what happened in the past. And it was always the same thing. You come in for your taxes. It'll probably happen this year, too. And the accountant will say, oh, you know what you should have done? Oh, if you only did this. Oh, you know, you could have done this. So we go through this whole woulda, coulda, shoulda. And that hit me as, you know, this is not the way to go. There's, there's tax preparation, which is reactive historical planning on what happened, and tax planning, which is proactive, how to change what happens in the future. So that's where I got involved, and I realized there's a whole area that's untapped. And I think you might even agree, still today, most advisors are not prepared for when the money is coming out. Now, today, it's coming, it's flooding out due to the demographics, the baby boomers taking money out, more people than retiring and people having both tax-deferred and tax-free money in a Roth. So the landscape is changing. Now we have the new SECURE Act. There were so many things hitting from every direction. You really need competent financial advice in this area, and I think it's still lacking. Uh, Ed, I totally agree. Let's let's back up a little bit. And you talked about 30 years ago, and I remember that there was... That was was, called the 80s. Yeah, the 80s. But but remember, Ed, before... (laughs) I think it was before the Tax Reform Act of 1987, they hadn't really given any guidance on how to get the money out of these IRAs or the rules weren't really in place. And people would say, well, I got to take my money out of my 401k. And they, you know, they, they didn't know that they had to roll it over within 60 days into an IRA or they would have to pay taxes on it. And at the end of the year, people would say, well, that, that's it. you got to pay taxes on it. Well, I spent the money. They yeah, came right. Up, so they came up with this mandatory 20% withholding. And then the perception was, well, so I only have to pay 20% tax. But that wasn't, that, that wasn't it, right? <laughs> no, that was just the withholding amount. Matter of fact, same thing happened to people last year after, and there were 18 taxes after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. You know, they were promised all these refunds. And it turned out the tax tables, the withholding tables were wrong. And a lot of them owed money, even though, in effect, their taxes were actually cut but they still owed money because they didn't withhold enough. The 20%, it was only withholding from plans. But back then, you could have been at a 40% rate. So you only had half the tax paid in. Yeah, so your whole thing, Ed, what you did was you formed this group, the Elite IRA Advisor Group. Talk to us about how you, what was your thought process when you did that? um, And why? Why did you start it? Well, I saw all the problems, but with every problem, as you know, is an opportunity. And I realized everybody's going to have these issues. At some point, everybody who saves in a retirement account, which is tens of millions of people, is going to have to take the money out and pay the piper one day, and they're not prepared. So it hit me as actually a business opportunity to start training advisors. I was doing that anyway, but then advisors, people like you, uh, and this goes back, oh, you may go back 20 years with me, something like that, started saying to me, Ed, you know, this, these waters are really deep and I don't think most advisors know this and I want to know more. That's what people like you told me. So eventually I I had collected the cards of uh, enough people just like you. Maybe there were 60, 70, I forget how many people that said, we want advanced education. We want to know more to help our clients. Now you would think every advisor would want to know more, but some of them have a real problem. And the problem is they don't know what they don't know. And that, that's pretty dangerous. That's the scary part. At least part. you knew these waters are deep because you had taken training. So people like you, you were one of that first group, what we call our charter members that said, let's get an advanced study group so we can educate them ourselves on that, not just in a seminar here and there, but with detailed workshops on and on, resources, back office support. And that's what we created. And that was back in 2005. So we're going into our six 16th year, believe it or not, Dean, you've been in this group, this advanced study group, Ed Slot's elite IRA advisor. I don't want to make you feel old, but well, you're starting your I, 16th year I look at as the a pictures. founding member, though, to your credit. I look at the pictures of you and I back then, and, and <laughs> we, we looked a lot different than we do here today. A little, I don't, a little I don't have those pictures. I don't look at those. <laughs> well, it's hanging on my wall in the office. So, all right, so you started this group. And the idea was that you could help the consumer by right. 
at educating the advisor, a broader reach. Well, Bo, right? that was the master plan. Remember, I'm more of a consumer advocate. I don't sell, as you know, but just to tell the audience, uh, I don't sell stocks, bonds, funds, insurance, annuities, none of that. I'm a tax advisor and a consumer advocate, but I realized, and so did advisors like you, that consumers were massively being underserved by unqualified advisors or advisors who were ignorant of the rules, not for any bad reason, and, you know, no malicious intent. They just didn't know that they didn't know. So m my uh, point was, you know, let's create this Ed Slots Elite IRA Advisor Group, highly trained advisors, and then match consumers. So both people need each other. Consumers need advisors that are highly trained that have specialized knowledge in this area. We're talking about the taxation of retirement savings when the money comes out in retirement. That's critical. Let's match consumers with advisors that have this knowledge, knowing that most advisors don't. And now, over many years, many consumers start to realize what I was saying is true. They start to realize, you know, I may have had a good advisor. He made me a ton of money, but it's what you keep that counts after taxes. And that's what determines how much money you'll have. Taxes are the single biggest factor that separates people from their retirement dreams. And there's no question about it. Most are not getting the advice. So I'm glad you're doing this program. I'm glad you're doing what you're doing because every time we get the message out there, and you know my favorite word, right? Outflow getting things out there to let their cons let people know their retirement savings are at risk, especially now of higher taxes. Let's toot your horn a little bit here, Ed. You had this idea that you could educate the consumer by putting together a program on public television. And that, that, that's been a massive success. And that's why I say, I think a lot of people will say, well, I know who Ed Slot is. He's a household name because he's been all over PBS all around the country. Talk to us about why you started that, how you did it, and then how many shows you've done and what kind of impact you've had for uh, public television and for the consumer. Well, it's just, uh, you know, something that morphed. You know, it's like I say, I talk to you about outflow, but as you and I know, what I mean is getting the message out. So I was doing seminars, as you know, all over the country, training advisors, educating consumers, and somebody caught wind of it and said, you know, this would be a great TV show. I said, TV for what? So it turned out, you know, this happened over three years, but I'll give you the 22nd version of three years. He knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy, PS, uh, a PBS producer said, uh, said no for three years until he finally saw me do a seminar down in Florida. He said, this would, this would be a great TV show. <laughs> so they put it on, and this was 12 years ago against all the better advice from the people. I don't know who, but you know, some people may be at public television said, how, is, uh, how are we going to make a success? And by success, remember, I hate to say it, but it's true. <laughs> uh, they don't really care what I'm doing. I could be juggling. If that brings in money, that's considered a success. Right. Okay? Right. So they consider a success by, you know, they rely on public support because of the educational programs they put on, which are fantastic. And they said, but how would this bring in money? How are people going to even sit through a show on death and taxes? Nobody wants to hear about that. Well, as you know, they were wrong. It became came uh, one of their top hit shows for, as far as I'm told some of the big the, one of the biggest uh, successes in PBS history and to show it I'm starting now my I believe 12th year and sixth show on the same topic which is unprecedented it shows there's a hunger for this information for people who have worked built, saved, sacrificed, and invested to have retirement savings. Now they have to get the money out and they don't want to lose it. They want to have more, keep more, and make it last. So this became a huge hit on public television. And if you're watching this year, yes, the show has been renewed. Uh, we have a new version running right now in 2020. And we have updated all the gift packages for all the 2020 rules for the SECURE Act. Maybe the first information out there in a wide, uh, wide ranging TV show, national TV, that covers the SECURE Act. So it's something everybody should look to. But you should also look to see that your advisor has this knowledge because everything you know about retirement rules has changed beginning in 2020. Now, if you're watching this, look at the calendar. It's 2020. These rules are effective now. You know, I think 
some people might be shocked that you're in your 12th year of doing public television and that you've done, you know, six different shows. But I, I would yeah. tell you, I've been studying with you now, like you said, for coming on 16 years. And yeah. there's not a workshop that I attend where I don't learn something still. Because the the amount of information that is out there in the tax code surrounding retirement accounts is so vast, it's impossible to memorize it all. Uh, and I know that if I run into a scenario where maybe I don't know, I think I've got a 95% thing, hey, I yeah. think I'm right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to your office and I'm going to say, hey, do I have this right? And there have been a couple of times like, no, I, I had something a little bit wrong, but you know what? My my clients always got it right because, you know, they knew they could ask me. And if I didn't know it a hundred percent, I could reach out to you. And, you know, it, it, there's a testimony to that of saying, Hey, 16 years of education and you still don't know it all. What are you stupid? No, it, it constantly <laughs> changes. changes. It's constantly changing. And you talk about memorizing the tax code. Remember the tax code is not even written in English. It's written in some version of Sanskrit that nobody could ever understand. I've always considered myself a translator turning the tax code, which I have right behind me here. But if I don't break this book, <laughs> this is just one <laughs> of several books. You notice a lot of post-it notes in here, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the tax code sections, putting this into English. Now, this particular book runs, I don't know, a few thousand pages, but uh, this is this is what Congress does. Do you think they know what's in here? No, Nobody not knows a chance. what's in here. Not a chance. Uh, it's ridiculous. That's what we do. So we we've all... been studying this for years, as you know, and it changes. Not only big tax laws like we just had, but as you know from going to the programs, a lot of under the radar rulings, cases, and updates that if you're not with it and up to date, you could lose chunks of your retirement savings. Savings. You know that the whole visual of that that book being just, just one <laughs> of the, the books. And this is just the most current version, right? My favorite section, 401A9, all the retirement rules. There they are. <laughs> Un unbelievable. I mean, you're right. It's not written in English. And there's rules to rules, right? And there's exceptions to rules. And it does, it gets super complicated. And the, the thing is that when I started studying with you and I started learning these things and I'm going back and then I started noticing the same mistakes. I didn't know that people were making those mistakes before. I, didn't, I may have made some of those mistakes before I started studying with you, but the, it, it's so vast. We even went to the extent, Edward, I don't even know if you know this now, but we've got four CPAs in our practice now. <laughs> and you know the, 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 the idea is doing what you said. It's, it's forward-looking tax planning, right? Understanding that at some point that money is going to come out you're going to either live on it or it's going to pass down to the next generation. So let's talk a little bit about this new SECURE Act. You, you're one of the smartest guys out there when it comes to you know how the retirement accounts work. This SECURE Act is much deeper than what anybody realizes. So give me, let, let's just start, and I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to give me five pieces out of the SECURE Act that are going to be critical to the consumer and let's just start with number one don't list them all out we'll go through all, we'll yeah. go through five of them all right What's obviously the, the biggest thing? one is the loss of the stretch ira this is something you've probably been using with all your clients knowing how to set up an inherited ira so the child or beneficiary or grandchild even could stretch or extend distributions on their inherited account over 40, 50, 70 years, depending on maybe you're a 10 year old or a one year old, that's all gone now, but it's not gone. And this is where the confusion is. It's not gone for certain classes of people. One class is anybody who inherited in 2019. You remember I said the law takes effect for most people in 2020. So if you're already sitting with an inherited IRA that you're doing the stretch, you're fine. But anybody else, when uh, somebody dies in 2020, uh, they are not going to get, the beneficiary is not going to get that long tax deferral over their lifetime. Instead, for most beneficiaries, it's being replaced with what's called a 10-year rule now, which means the government wants its money. That's what this is all about. They want, don't want to wait for their money because they're broke. Look at the deficit. So where do they go? And this is an important thing to know. Where do they go? They always go 
to raid people's retirement accounts. That's where Congress always goes. You know why? Because that's where the money is. They know all of those trillions. And I just saw the latest stat, actually, in today's Wall Street Journal. It just said about 18 trillion. Yeah, there it is. Uh, 18 trillion. Yeah, today's Wall Street Journal. So you see how prepared I am? There you go. Eight, 18.3 trillion. Uh, the government says, oh, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of that number that could fill the budget de- deficit. So, well, so uh, here's, here's what I think this was all about. Ed, you tell me if you agree with me or not. But I, I think this was about a way to increase taxes without actually increasing the tax rate. And right, exactly. And the, and the other thing is that you're taxing <laughs> dead people who can't complain. Right, right. That's the greatest constituency. Yeah, dead people don't write letters to their congressmen. They don't complain. They don't vote. Well, most dead people don't vote. (laughs) But most people are not going to complain. So it's an easy target. But lots of people are upset about it. Who's upset? People that are still alive with uh, retirement accounts, 401ks and IRAs. Why? Because they arrange their lives based on long-standing rules that they thought they could trust what they could rely on, and Congress pulled the rug out from under them in the ninth inning of the game, and they feel it's not fair. Now, Congress's point of view is, well, this money's for retirement. We never told you to leave it over, all that money for beneficiaries, but I know lots of people, maybe you do too, that said, you know what? If they told us that up front, we might have arranged our affairs differently. I've heard from people say, you know, we lived less lavishly, and we weren't big spenders because our plan all along was to have a legacy to our children or even grandchildren. And now that's all going to be accelerated. The tax is accelerated now into 10 years after death. So for most non-spouse beneficiaries, there's no more stretch for a death in 2020 or later. And it's replaced with what we call the 10-year rule, which means all the money has to come out within 10 years by the end of the 10th year after death, which means Congress is going to get their money sooner and more of it. And we don't even know what the rates will be. And remember, many beneficiaries give an average life expectancy. Let's say an IRA owner dies, say, 80 years old. Chances are they have a 50-year-old child that might be in their peak earnings years. Exactly. And they will be hit at their top bracket. That's that's so, the part that I think gets me more frustrated than anything else is that the is that, that that is who the beneficiary is going to be. It's that person in their peak earning years. Right. And now you're going to throw all of this IRA money on top of that bracket that they're already in, maybe throwing them up into the top tax bracket. And all of a sudden, this money is going to be taxed at a higher rate than it was ever deferred at. Right. And that's where you lose money. And that's where the government gets money. Now, not everybody is subject to this. It's not as uh, terrible as it might seem because it doesn't affect. Here's the good news. Most people. Why? Because spouses are exempt. Most people leave their IRAs or 401ks to their spouses. So even this 10-year rule can be delayed until the second spouse dies. Obviously, if you're single, then yes, it's a problem. When you die, the 10-year rule kicks in. There's also four other exemptions to this stretch rule, but these are not, these are not cases that are going to happen that often. Minor children are exempt, but people misunderstand this one. Not grandchildren, your minor children. So what are the odds, by minor children we mean uh, somebody hasn't reached majority, which is 18 in most states, some 21. So what are the odds of an 85-year-old dying with a 12-year-old child of theirs? Yeah. Unlikely. Right. So that's not a big group. It's more likely somebody dies with a 12-year-old child is 40 years old, but if they're only 40, they don't have as much accumulated at that point, so it still won't be a big issue. So they're exempt, but even these minor children are only exempt until they reach majority, and then the 10-year rule comes in. Unless they're still in school, then they can go to age 26. Then there's two other categories, which we hope you don't qualify, disabled and chronically ill. And then the last category of people exempt. So there are five categories of people exempt. Spouses, the minor children, disabled, chronically ill, and the strange group of beneficiaries not more than 10 years younger than you like a brother, a friend, a partner, a cousin, somebody around your same age. Congress said, who cares about them? They're as old as you. There won't be a big stretch thing there anyway. 
But everybody else, most non-spouses, will be stuck with the 10-year rule. So they won't get the stretch. The taxes will be accelerated. And they will have to plan for that. And the big hit is going to be the people that save the most. That's why you've heard me say this for 20 years. Our tax system is a penalty on savers. The ones who save the most, somebody has a two, $3 million IRA, not because they're some Wall Street executive, because they work for the money. The only way money can get in a 401k originally is to work for it. And then through diligent and disciplined saving and investing and working over 30 years, it built up. They rolled it to an IRA and now regular, you know, the millionaire next door (laughs) has 3 million in their IRA. Well, these people are likely to leave their IRA to a trust because they don't want their kids squandering or losing the money right after death uh, to lawsuits, bankruptcy, divorce, mismanagement, people preying on them because they came into all this money. So they name a trust. Most of these trusts now will also be subject to the 10 year rule, throwing that system into disarray. And almost all of those plans have to be changed. And you're going to learn about them right. in our main workshop. Right. Coming up. I, I'm looking forward to that. But I, I, I want to talk about that because this, this whole idea, you know, there, there are the, the, the trusts out there that are the living trust, the see through trust, the ones that have the designated beneficiaries. Right. But a lot of times people don't really understand the mechanics of if somebody passes away and the IRA asset goes into the trust. So first of all, the trust can't own the IRA asset, right? Right. The, the- Only the RMDs go into the trust. But here's the thing I didn't mention about this 10-year rule, and this is the trap. Uh, it's actually a good thing in the law, but a, a trap with trusts. They're under this 10 year rule, let's go back to the stretch. Under the stretch, as you know, the kid could go out maybe 40, 50 years. He takes 140th, 139th, very small distributions, RMDs every year, but they get to stretch it or extend it over decades. With the 10 year rule, there are no post death RMDs each year. You don't have to take anything out. The only RMD is at the end of the 10th year after death, then everything has to come out. So you could do whatever you want within the 10 years, which gives beneficiaries who have good advisors like you, you know, guiding them to take it out maybe when they're in a lower bracket. Let's say you have a beneficiary who inherits, but they're still working and making a decent income, like we talked. They're peak earnings years. But let's say five years from now, they plan on retiring. Maybe don't take anything until they retire and their income is lower so you can manage it. But this 10 year rule also applies to the trusts, which means by the end of the 10th year after death, all of that IRA money has to go into the trust and it will all be taxed if it's a traditional IRA at one shot. Or it could be taxed within the 10 years, but everything that comes into the trust is taxed. And if it's retained in the trust, not given out to beneficiaries because they want to make sure the beneficiaries don't blow it, then it's taxed generally at trust tax rates, which are are the highest rates in the land. So you got a real tax problem and you don't have the protection you thought you might have had without a prohibitive tax cost. So are you crystal clear on everything that's going to happen with the trust yet? I've I've talked to no. some of the CPAs in here, and, and they're saying, Dean, I'm afraid to give somebody advice on exactly how to change it. And of course, now we're recording this in uh, mid-February of 2020, so we're, we're shortly after this SECURE Act has come out. And and so you know, some of the people are saying, well, maybe we should just get the trust off of the beneficiary form right now and just put the kids on, right? Especially if they're adult well, kids. Well, yeah, you got a tough choice there because- Every person has to make their own decision. Like I said, if somebody has a $3 million IRA or something, and they have a child that has maybe addiction problems or financial problems, that's the last thing they want for that money to go right out to them because they know it's it may be lost. So they may have to keep the trust, but probably revise it immediately with an attorney that has the right language. Now, here's the problem. It's also spawned, believe it or not, like you said, we're only, say, two months in, not even in to the Secure Act, and attorneys, all the they're selling. You may have seen it online. All different versions. They make up their own trusts and call it names and things. Like I saw one of them. Uh, like they have all these names, and some of them are just gimmicks, and they don't work. 
Uh, so you have to be very careful that the trust is done correctly. So you may need it to be revised if you're worried about that. Or if that's not a big concern, get the beneficiary, the trust's beneficiary off. And if you have a good attorney, that trust, the original trust, may be able to be reformed. Or cha- Obviously, you could change the trust while you're alive. So right. maybe you should look into that. So, into that. so just this one piece of the SECURE Act, Ed, where you, you, the, which is all losing the stretch and the trust and all that, I'm, I'm sitting back looking at this, and I see three winners. The IRS, <laughs> attorneys, right, and insurance companies. Yeah. Those are the three because, winners. Yeah, definitely. Because insurance, you know, I don't sell life insurance. I think I said it earlier today, but that has replaced the IRA. In my opinion, some people loudly disagree with me. To me, an IRA, which was never a great asset to leave to a trust or leave to a beneficiary because it was tax deferred. It had all the rules, it had all the landmines, even with the trusts in the past that was a post to work. A lot of them, as you know, were done improperly and they blew up and didn't work as planned. IRAs were never a great asset to leave over. Now they're worse than ever because of of the new rules forcing that money out. I think you're better off having, uh, if you have a large IRA that's meant to have the lion's share go to the beneficiary, you might be better off with what I call a life insurance replacement plan, where you take some of that money down now, pay the tax, yes, I said pay the tax up front at today's incredibly low rates. Look at the brackets. You can be in the 20, 24% and earn hundreds of thousands of dollars. Take it out at low rates and reinvest it in a cash value life insurance policy so you could have access to it tax-free during your life if you need it. But after death, it pays to the beneficiary. Now, if you're still worried about the beneficiary blowing the money, first of all, the life insurance that pays off will be tax free, but you could leave that life insurance instead of the IRA to a trust where it's a lot more flexible. You have more planning flexibility because you don't have to worry about the IRA rules. There are no RMDs, there are no taxes. It doesn't matter who the beneficiaries are. You create your own plan. It's like you can design your customized estate plan. You can simulate the stretch, say my beneficiary can get this insurance money over 20 or 50 years. You can allow for invasions, distributions if they need money, maybe for education or maintenance or support or things like that. And you give your trustee those powers. Plus, when the money comes in, it's all tax free. So you have no RMDs, no tax complications and no rules and no tax. Right. So I think what Congress do- has done has awakened the giant and they've incentivized people to do probably the better planning they should have been doing all along because it doesn't matter what vehicle gets you there. So the IRA was the vehicle, the stretch IRA, but it ran out of gas at death. The engine <laughs> seizes up. Uh, now you have to switch vehicles and you may be better off in a different vehicle. All you want, if you're listening to this and you've saved a lot in an IRA a 401k, generally what I've heard from people for 30 years is a same thing. You want three things. You want post-death control because you don't want those kids blowing your hard-earned money. And you want less taxes or tax-free, post-death control and tax minimization. How you get there, as long as you get there, to me, doesn't matter. So I think life insurance is a much better vehicle for this kind of estate planning than your current IRA plan. Let's there are those the, who disagree with me, as you know, well, you may have seen around. I, around. I, you know what, but it, I agree with you that, you that it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you're, it's effective. Here's one of the things that if I was thinking. If your old thinking. car breaks down, you get a new one. <laughs> Here's one thing I was thinking of, Ed. What if... You have two spouses, right? Let's say that they both have a million dollars in their IRA. So one guy has two spouses? <laughs> no, husband and wife. Oh, okay, because I don't know where you're broadcasting from. <laughs> we're, the, we're the Midwest. <laughs> we don't go that way here. Uh, so you have, you have um, husband and wife, each with a million dollars in their IRA. When the first spouse dies, what happens? Well, the surviving spouse can inherit that IRA, right? Then they still have the ability to inherit that IRA. There's no 10-year rule, nothing like that, right? What if we just had enough life insurance for that surviving spouse to use the death benefit to pay the taxes to convert that IRA over to a Roth IRA? Now we've got tax-free assets that can pass down to the beneficiaries. Yes, that tax-free money, the Roth still has to come out in 10 years, but it doesn't, it doesn't kill them with taxes. So now all of a sudden you're paying all the taxes with 
an insurance policy at the death of the first spouse, right? And and now you got tax free income for the surviving spouse. That helps us with that whole idea that when you're a single taxpayer, you're hitting those higher rates at lower income thresholds. So right. it could be a win-win for two generations there. Yeah. And uh, we didn't mention it, but Roth IRAs are another strategy to solve the trust problem. If you convert to a Roth IRA, which you hit on, and you still wanted a trust, uh, the Roth IRA will work better in the trust because there's no trust taxes because those distributions into the trust after death will generally be tax free. You could even do a Roth conversion. Let's say you have two spouses, like you said, married to each other, a husband <laughs> yes, and wife. Yes. And a husband, uh, I had to clarify that because the way you said it didn't sound right. <laughs> it's like that commercial. That's not right. You know, that commercial yeah, where yeah. they say that's not right. <laughs> uh, say the husband converts his IRA to a Roth and he uses up the low brackets, which may be a good move, and he leaves the Roth IRA to his wife. But instead of a life insurance policy on the wife, maybe they get a second to die policy because they might not need a payout because the wife, if she inherits the Roth IRA, there are no RMDs. If she ever needs that money, it's all tax free. She never has to take it out. But when she dies, uh, then the 10 year rule kicks in. But then you could have the life insurance. And even if the 10 year rule kicks in with a Roth, it's still tax free. So you can combine the strategies however you want. But those are the two better strategies than inheriting an IRA. All right. So let's move on to number two in the Secure Act. What's the second big piece? I know that the end of the stretch is probably in, in you and I's mind, yeah. one of the biggest. But what else is out there? There's something uh, everything you... else is trimming around the edges. This was the big piece. What... You know, Congress, was crowing about these provisions, the one I'm going to tell you about now, the RMD age being raised to age 72. Congress is patting themselves on the back. You saw it crowing about like, it's like they think they want American Idol uh, just changing the RMD age. This is what they thought was phenomenal from 70 and a half, which everybody knows all the way up to 72. Yeah, big deal. Yeah, big deal. But here's what I tell you I like about this provision. So they thought they got uh, rid of uh, what I like about that provision is they finally got rid of the 70 and a half. That to me, uh, to most people, not to me as much because I, I understand it, but that was the most confusing part of the law for over 20 years. People didn't know, am I 70? Am I 71? When am I 70 and a half? Which table do I use? What age? Do I use age 70? Do I use age 71? That confounded so many people. So good riddance. We don't have the 70 and a half year calculation, the half year calculation anymore. But we, so that's the single big, biggest benefit. But we still do have this provision. We still, provision. We, still, we still do have 70 and a half because that's still the age that you can do a QCD. Right, right. So but you don't, it doesn't, right. Yeah, they forgot to change that part. So they change it to 72, but there's even a trap with that. So what happened is because they did everything rush, rush, like almost sneaky under the cover of night. I'm talking about Congress, you know, when they did this December 20th, right. people woke up January 1st, it's effective. And then they heard, oh, 72. So I can wait till 72. Not if you were already 70 and a half in 2019. The old rules still apply to you. You don't get a year off. So the 72 only applies to people who turn 70 and a half in 2020 or later. How do you know? All right, I'm going to give you an easy rule. If your birthday is July 1st, 1949 or later, you get age 72. So that might be easier to way to remember it because most people know when their birthday is, right? So <laughs> that means you should. can delay it till 72 okay. if you know when your birthday is. All right. So the, 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 to me, that, that was helps. A, that, that's a, it's a big nothing. It's yeah. a big nothing. Exactly right. It, it's like ho-hum. And, 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 you know, the, the crazy thing is that when they were trying to sell the benefits of this Secure Act, because remember, this thing sat in the Senate for probably, what, seven, eight months? Yeah, it, it, was, it was in May it came out. It sat in the, it sat in the Senate, right. The House uh, voted it out, I think, in May of yeah. 2019. And it sat around growing dust. And then they had to fill the budget gaps at the end. They said, what is this thing laying right? Ah, put that in there. Sign it up. What is that? I don't know, but sign it up. It's Christmas. We want to go home. That's how it became law. Right. And it, and it was all <laughs> part of the budget deal, right? Right. 
They just tucked it in there and yeah, put it in the back. Yeah, throw this thing in the back. What thing? Don't even ask. We want to go home for Christmas. It was it was ridiculous. All right, so you got the seventy two as opposed to seventy and a half. Yeah. Um, let's. But let's the t- other thing is uh, the thing you mentioned. The QCDs. The seventy and a half is still the age for QCDs. QCDs are qualified charitable distributions. This is one of the best provisions in the tax code. It didn't come from this act, but this act. Uh, and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, actually, a couple of years before, made QCDs much more valuable. These are contributions you can make directly from your IRA. The only negative is it doesn't apply to as enough people. It only applies to IRA owners who are 70 and a half, and as you correctly stated, that age is still 70 and a half, even under the SECURE Act, even though the RMD age went up to 72, it only applies to IRA owners who are 70 and a half years old or older. And you have to actually be 70 and a half, not the year you turn. So if you uh, turn 70 and a half tomorrow, you can't use it today. So for that group of people, it doesn't apply to plans like 401ks, just IRA owners or beneficiaries who are 70 and a half years old or older, they can transfer directly from their IRA to a charity. Now, I'm not saying just give your whole IRA to a charity. I'm talking about, I mean, under that theory, if yeah, if you give all your money to charity, you'll have less tax. I'm saying don't give more to charity. Do the giving you're already doing, but give this way and you'll save a lot on taxes. Why? Because most people found out last year the first time they're not getting uh, deductions for the charitable gifts they made because most of them got hit with the uh, taking the larger standard deduction. Doing the giving this way, you get the larger standard deduction, but you also get Uh, the benefit of giving to charity. Actually, you get better than the old charitable deduction because this is an exclusion from income. It comes right off the top. So it's a good way to whittle down your IRA at no tax at all. And the amount you use, the QCD satisfies, can go towards satisfying your RMD. You could even do more than the RMD. You can do up to 100,000 a year. So that's the way to give and save taxes at the same time. Since you're not getting a deduction for your gifts anyway, here you're getting better than a deduction and exclusion from income. Totally agree. Since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we've used QCDs more than any other time in my 32 years. Yeah, everybody should be using them, but most people don't. But there's there's another piece in the SECURE Act that is going to cause complications, and that is that if you still have earned income after the age of 70, you can still make a deductible contribution to your IRA, right? Right. Don't do it. It's a trap. It's a trap. (laughs) It's like from that, uh, you know, I was going to show at the meeting, the born to run video, uh, because there's a line in there. It's a death trap. It's a suicide rap. Better get out while you're young. (laughs) It's a trap. Uh, You know, it's it's amazing. Congress gave billions. You know, most of these tax bills, these uh, budget bills that went in at the like I said, under the cover of night at the end of the year last year were written by lobbyists, giving billions the biggest tax breaks to the biggest companies. But here's what really irked Congress. They were afraid people like you and I and everybody with a retirement account might give too much money to charity. Ooh. So they lowered the hammer on this in the, in one of the most ridiculous tax provisions I've ever seen. And you mentioned it. You hit it right on the head. So now they eliminated the restriction, uh, the age restriction. Before the SECURE Act, if you ha- wanted to contribute to a traditional IRA, you couldn't do it after 70 and a half. Uh, now you can. But if you do a deductible contribution, which you shouldn't do, but if you do it and you want to do a QCD Somebody, some staffer, I wonder who that, you know, person is that thought he was the hero of the country that stuffed that in because no congressman could ever have figured this out. So if you give seven thousand, if you uh, take a tax deductible IRA, assuming you have the earnings after 70 and a half uh, and you deduct it, but you also give the 7000 to charity, they say that's double dipping. <gasps> oh, oh, the horror. And we're going to make your uh, QCD taxable. So here's the answer. Don't do that. Nobody should be doing a deductible IRA after 70 and a half anyway. Your tax rate is probably low. You're probably in lower income. 
do a Roth IRA. There were never any age restrictions for that. So you can do a Roth IRA and still do the QCD from your other IRA money uh, if you have it. But I'm afraid. So av- Ed, avoid that problem altogether. I'm afraid that what's going to happen here is because of what you said at the very beginning of this podcast is that most CPAs are reactive what could I do to reduce my tax bill? They're going to tell people, hey, oh, yeah, do you it can the make a contra- and the QCD. Yeah. Don't do it. No. You heard hey. it here on the Dean Barber <laughs> Financial Group radio network. Hey, here's, Don't do it. Here's the deal. <laughs> because there's another it's component. It's a trap. There's another it's a component. cookbook, like yeah. I said on the Twilight Zone. It's a cookbook. And, the, and there's a clawback <laughs> provision too, right? A clawback provision so that if you weren't doing a QCD in the same year, there, right. and let's say you did 10 years worth of those $7,000 It never goes away. Yeah. That, now you want to do a QCD. Well, the first $70,000 that you do in a QCD is going to be taxable. Now, let, let me put other things in perspective too. Remember, if you're doing a deductible IRA into your 70s, uh, and you do the QCD, so you have that problem. And at the same time, money's coming out the other way because you're R&Ds. subject to required minimum distribution. you got money coming from every street. It's like standing in the middle of an intersection with cars coming every which way and no traffic light. How is anybody going to track this on a tax return? So how does so this how does this impact avoid it? How does this impact the self-employed individual who's contributing to a SEP? It doesn't. See, that's what's crazy. SEP, they could do that. I, I know... The, the problem Congress had with this, they felt, oh, wait a minute, they're giving money that was uh, they got a deduction for. But if you think about it, all the money that goes into QCDs was money you got a deduction for. It was just earlier, not later. I don't know what the problem is Congress had with this, but they felt they had to put it in. Think about it. All the money by law, actually, the only money you can use for a QCD is is a uh, pre-tax money. Right. So all of the money going into any QCD was money you once got a deduction for. So I don't understand it. It's the, the dumbest thing I've ever seen in a tax law, but somebody got a gold ribbon somewhere, some staffer in Washington, probably walking around with a little trophy. Look what I did. Yeah, I, I think that this <laughs> this SECURE Act was the biggest money grab that I've ever seen out of Congress. Yeah, oh yeah. So that's a, a ba- you know, that's a new provision, but a trap. And that's why you're listening to programs like this. Because the accountants won't see the trap until this year, uh, this time next year when they're doing the returns. And then they have to figure out they're going to have to go. Accountants are going to have to go to seminars just how to calculate the amount of a taxable QCD. That's what Congress created, something I'm now calling the taxable QCD. How do you have a tax on money you give to charity? Right. Now, now? But Ed, think about this. Think about the number of people who either do a tax return in a box, they go to one of the big national chains, and they've got either a computer or they've got somebody who isn't real, who's, I would say, the epitome of reactive uh, from a tax perspective. People are going to make so many mistakes. I think the mistakes that we're going to be seeing made because of this SECURE Act is going to go back to what you were witnessing 30 years ago right. before they ever talked about the rules on how to get the money out of these accounts. And, and I think that the, it's a trap. The whole thing's a trap. And it's going to it's a it, trap. It's going to flood. Are you, are you a, uh, a, a Twilight Zone fan? Well, back in the day. You I, know what I, I'm referring to I in do. that episode where they say it's a cookbook. <laughs> it's a trap. And it was called To Serve Man. Ah, yeah, you're, I, you're, if you I don't remember that. that. Uh, yeah. Twilight Zone, they'll know what I mean. It's like a Trojan horse. It was meant to sound good. And you know what I tell you in every program. Whenever, here's a clue. Whenever Congress names a law, you can be sure it will always do the opposite. So when they call it the SECURE Act, you better run. Your your money is less secure. And this started back in the 80s when I had the laugh of my life well, over tax law, when they called it that, that, that tax law the Deficit Reduction Act. Yeah. How did that work out? <laughs> Oh, well, you know, look at the deficits we have today. <laughs> Obviously, it worked out great. I mean, no, the, but the thing is, I think that if if I could just get people to get a good relationship with a, a good financial planner that's working closely with a good CPA that's not reactive, that's proactive and forward-looking, we can help people avoid a lot of these traps. And that's what your entire education program that's built to do. That's what our elite IRA advisor group is all about, proactive planning, before it, you know, in the best way to describe it is planning before it hits the fan. Yes. <laughs> and, and again, you said it earlier, 
that the taxes are the biggest wealth eroding factor facing people in retirement. But the truth is that if you're doing forward-looking planning, you have more control, especially during those retirement years, than you ever had during your work. That is the key. You can control your tax rate. Most people don't realize that. They do nothing. That's why I say in all my TV shows and all my consumer programs, you either get your plan or the government plan. Most people get the government plan because they do nothing. They don't have advisors that have the level of knowledge you have in our elite advisor group. So they get the default plan, which is the government plan, which is never a good plan. Totally agree. Ed, listen, you've been so kind with all of your time here, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you here in a, about a month and a half and learning oh, more. Yeah. So um, I guess with that, I'm going to just say thank you for the education over the last 16 years. Thank you for taking part in the Guided Retirement Show and all the appearances that you've had on America's Wealth Management Show sure. the rest well, of the day. Well, I'm proud to be with you, Dean. You're one of the top people as a founding member of Ed Slot's Elite IRA Advisor Group. You've always valued education, and that empowers people to make better decisions, but you have to have somebody guiding you that's up to date, that stays up to date, proactive planning before it hits the fan. Your plan, not the government plan. Thanks, Ed. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ed Slot. As you know, and you can tell, he's not the typical CPA. As he said, he's a recovering CPA That guy has more information pent up in him. We're going to be sure to invite Ed back on here and get another episode or two with him because the tax code continues to change. The complexities are out there. Every single person is in a different situation, and it's important that you have a great guide for your retirement. We appreciate you joining us here on the Guided Retirement Show, and hopefully we get a chance to meet you in person someday. Investment advisory services offered through Barbara Financial Group and SEC Registered Investment Advisor.